Hello, everybody, um, and welcome to this uh, panel discussion um, on Ukrainian perspectives on the war in Ukraine. Um, I'm Lucinda Platt. I'm head of department of social policy at the London School of Economics, um, and I feel very uh, privileged to be able to welcome um, the panelists here today. Um, so we have um, with us today, uh, we have Andrei Yevchenko, who is a PhD student at London School of Economics and who has set up this panel, panel today for us. Um, his research interests are in behavioral public policy with a particular focus on online privacy. Um, and he's uh, published widely, um, for example, in a Journal of Economic Behavior and Organizations and J Journal of Behavioral Economics for Policy and other journals. So he's a um, very um, a well published researcher already. We have uh, Timothy Brick, who's assistant professor at Kiev School of Economics, and he's the head of center for the sociological research uh, there, and uh, in particular with focus on decentralization and local development studies. He obtained his PhD at Carlos de Ferro in Madrid, um, and he's a co-chair of the Social Inequality Network at the European Social Science History Conference. And he's also a member of Vox Ukraine IDEA. We have with us Ostap Vatamaniuk, who's a professor of economics in the Department of Economics at Ivan Franko National University of Lviv. And his uh, research and teaching interests are in microeconomics, business economics, decision-making theory and practice. And uh, during the 1990s, he's participated in the translation of no a number of e economics textbooks um, by, for example, Samuelson and Nordhaus, McConnell and Brew, um, and others, and translated those into Ukrainian for use in the teaching. We have with us Tatiana Moriak, who's Associate Professor of Economics in the Economics Department um, at the Ivan Franko National University of Lviv. Our research is in macroeconomics and fiscal instruments of macroeconomic regulation. Valery Reznikov is the Doctor of Public Administration, um, PhD in Economics and Dean of the School of International Economic Relations and Travel Business at VN Karazin Kharkiv National University. He is an expert on the NGO platform of public diplomacy and is the regional head of the Ukrainian Association of International Economics. And last but not least, we have Denise Gancha, who is a master's program student in international relations and communications at the VN uh, Karazin Kharkiv National University. Denise is a participant of the UN Youth Delegate Program and a member of the Youth Advisory Council under the president of Ukraine. So thank you very much to all of our participants for attending. The, uh, the order for today is that there are going to be three blocks where uh, our speakers are going to, our panelists are going to speak for a few minutes, and then there will be some discussion and Q&A, and then there'll be some a further opportunity for Q&A at the end. So please use the um, webinar Q&A function if you do want to pose any questions to the panelists. Um, and Andre, who will be moderating all the sessions, uh, will select from them as appropriate. So without more ado, I will hand over uh, for the first se session, which is on international relations perspectives, um, and to uh, Valery Reznikov and Denise Gancha, who are going to speak in this section. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucinda. Um, I will take it from here. And um, first of all, I want, want to say that I hope everyone, especially Denise from Ukraine, are uh, safe given the circumstances. And um, the first session that we're going to talk today about uh, war in Ukraine from international relations and diplomacy perspectives. So I invite um, uh, Professor uh, Valery Reznikov and Denise Gazza to participate in this session and uh, share um, your views on on a number of topics. So, uh, Valery, let's start from you, uh, if possible. Um, and probably the question is, from, from your perspective, what is the international role and the status of Ukraine after the Russian invasion from on 24th of August of this year? Uh, 
Good afternoon, dear organizers and participants of discussion. I am glad to see you, everyone, uh, uh, alive and healthy. Have you are all surprised, but big war in Europe taking place even in the 21st century. Uh, and I want uh, to summarize my position uh, on the aggressive and uh, inhuman uh, action of Russia towards Ukraine. Uh, and I would like to make a short presentation about, uh, about uh, uh, our uh, topic of uh, discussion. Uh, first of all, Ukraine didn't believe that Russia would start uh, a war until at last day. Uh, but Russia started the war against Ukraine without officially declaring war through the diplomatic channels. I think it's... Uh, not uh, polite uh, in uh, during this uh, this time and uh, the leaders of russia had planned to capture ukraine in three or four days and uh, we're preparing a victory parade in kiev and kharkiv but ukraine has been holding the line for the most uh, the almost a month as well uh, uh, as we can see not single large city has been captured except the Kherson, but uh, such cities as um, uh, uh, both Kyiv, Kharkiv, Lviv, Odessa, uh, Dnieper, uh, Zaporizhia are not uh, are not captured. Uh, we can safely say uh, say that Putin's uh, blitzkrieg plan plans uh, failed. And the Russian army just started bombing peaceful towns and villages out uh, of India. I am a witness to this as a resident of hero of the uh, city of Kharkiv. As the first three days, the Russian bombing were targeted uh, at military uh, facilities. And the fourth days, shelling of the uh, residential area began. Uh, do you know that uh, it was terrible to hear bombing and uh, to uh, to see to watch uh, a lot of uh, killed people uh, uh, through the streets. Uh, I would like to say that Russia adheres uh, uh, to the geopolitical principles of neo-Eurasianism as well as uh, the concept of Alexander Dugin and Yevgeny Primakov. Uh, according to these recommendations, uh, Putin intends to uh, revive the Russian Empire from the countries of uh, post-Soviet uh, space uh, by force. Russian geopolitical uh, geopolitics Alexander Dugin, who says that the main task of Moscow to expand its strategic influence uh, to the east, west, and south. Uh, the main barrier to Russia imperial expansion is Ukraine and Poland. We can see it. Uh, and uh, because these countries are the gates of the Eastern Europe. In order to bring Russia to its dreams to global domination, Dugin proposed to destroy the buffer zone, uh, conceding uh, of the states of Eastern Europe, especially Ukraine and Poland. Uh, we were uh, warned about uh, such accents, but as big Brzezinski, jo uh, George Friedman, Emmanuel Wallerstein, and others in uh, their scientific studies. Vladimir Putin want, uh, wants to show that Russia has the right to be called the great states like uh, United States, China, Great Britain, through the uh, 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 aggression against Ukraine. But uh, the stubborn resistance of the Ukrainian army and people shows uh, the entire world community uh, that it is too early to talk about this. And uh, conclusions. As the union uh, between Central European countries, Ukraine, Belarus, and Poland, uh, lost its geopolitical advantage in the 17th century, it became an object of uh, competition between the great power countries of Western and Eastern Europe. 
uh, as dissolved uh, of USSR uh, caused Ukraine to be uh, separated from the similar economic system created by Soviet, uh, Soviet rule. As a result, it uh, once more uh, is an object of uh, competition between European and Eurasian unions. Currently, Ukraine is an area of uh, competition between Western and Anglo-Saxon countries or sea civilization, uh, both NATO and uh, NATO and uh, Eurasian countries. It is uh, which belong to uh, civilization of of, uh, of land uh, and uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Currently, the main goal of the uh, Eurasian countries to establish an uh, Berlin, Moscow, Pekin exist, uh, and um, we can. Pardon. Uh, and we can see that uh, modern war uh, um, uh, with Ukraine, it is uh, like a mark of the uh, aggressive, uh, aggressive step of Russia to extend uh, their in influence, uh, uh, first of all, in, in Europe. And uh, I think that we, they will not stop, uh, uh, they will not stop in future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valery, for sharing your view on, on <clears throat> geopolitical uh, strategy, let's say, of Russian Federation here. Um, that's quite an interesting aspect. I would like to turn uh, now to Denise, and my question would be probably, uh, what do you think about the role, and everyone actually discussing that, what is the role of United Nations now and other institutions in resolving this crisis that we have now? Uh, sure. First of all, I just really wanted to mention that I'm not big of research i'm still a student it's really a big honor for me to be in such a very nice scientific circle uh, but being a person who is more than five years in active diplomacy and also in the tight connections with the ministry of foreign affairs of ukraine what we do see from our perspective that still the response from many international organizations was very weak to this conflict and i'm first of all of course speaking about the nations united nations osce and some other organizations which have really not provided enough support to ukraine but also uh, apart from not being active in supporting ukraine they have proven themselves at some point as uh, the servants of the russian interests because we do see that the russian security uh, that the united nations security council has already proven it's all that it needs to be transformed because uh, there is no way you can respond with the Security Council until there is an aggressor sitting there. Also, we have not seen real good action from the OSCE, and I think that we are also already thinking in Ukraine that there will be no OSCE or at least highly transformed. And what also our president said, that uh, the international security system will uh, needs a big review, because right now we are seeing that uh, countries are really providing very weak response to what is happening in Ukraine. And also a lot of people, uh, high officials, uh, they are still uh, reflecting to Russian propaganda and they uh, support the messages which were said by uh, Vladimir Putin and his puppets. And the thing is that uh, we have all seen the, probably in the news that uh, in the UN they have even prohibited some of their employees to call what is happening in Ukraine a war. So they, they are mostly using uh, in their communications the word conflict. And this is the big problem, of course, because uh, what we are telling the world and we have been telling for eight years to the whole world that Russia must be punished for this, uh, for this, for this action. Prime Minister Johnson said the right thing that were the world react to the annexation of Crimea in 2014, there will be no war in Ukraine today. And this is really a big problem that we have the big response. We have uh, a lot of bureaucratic processes going on in the European Union, NATO, United Nations. And in, in Ukraine, believe me, we don't have time for a big diplomacy. We don't have time for ethics. We don't have time to agree on something. We just need support and it needs to come very fast amidst everything. And this is the big problem, which I'm really seeing. And even uh, as I'm uh, having a meeting with, uh, after this uh, session, I will have a meeting with the 
United Nations General Secretary Yuthan Voy, and even she is not able to call uh, the, the, the events in Ukraine a war. So what we're speaking about. And uh, whenever you have these possibilities, of course, you need to urge international community to change this, because what we are seeing right now, that there is no way Russia should be accepted to the Western democratic world, and we should remove Russia from any international fora. It should be removed from receiving, receiving any support from the UN institutions, European Union institutions, and others, because the only way the whole Europe will have the security guarantees is that we make sure that Russia will be demilitarized and we probably achieve uh, the overthrow of the Putin's regime. But of course, it's more to ask. But the thing is that uh, people in the whole Europe still do not probably understand the situation that if Ukraine fail, there will be more countries to come. But still, uh, thanks very much for supporting us. Uh, it's really important that right now the academic uh, connections, they are working between our universities and they do hope that uh, London School of Economics and many other institutions in the United Kingdom uh, will not stop on assisting Ukrainian academic community in the help they need. Because right now, uh, Valery Reznikov can prove this, our university is nearly destroyed. Half of its uh, corpuses, uh, half of its buildings are destroyed. The dormitories are destroyed. And the best thing you can do right now to assist us is, of course, to uh, donate money directly to our university and also to accept Ukrainian students and Ukrainian professors to your universities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Denise. Uh, thanks for a very uh, emotional and you know powerful uh, um, voice sharing your voice here. Um, that's that's very interesting topics and quite global um, and quite wide ranging uh, topics here. And there's possible shifts in the global uh, security balances that what what we one would expect given the closer cooperation now between Ukraine and the neighboring countries with Poland, uh, Romania, uh, Baltic states. Um, what is your views, either you, Denise or Valeri, on this new global security blocks that are likely to emerge or are they likely to emerge? What's your view on this? You know, I can probably start because there was already a proposal from our president uh, to create some kind of a block which will be able to react in 24 hours. It's probably, um, I do not know if we have new security blocks. It's probably maybe we should think about reforming the old ones, especially the NATO. And I really hope that Ukraine will one day will join NATO because we have already proven ourselves as a very powerful ally and our war experience will be needed for you. I would like to add that uh, you know that Ukraine uh, strike some uh, agreement with uh, NATO countries and both uh, Poland, Great Britain uh, also. Uh, and uh, we know that Ukraine has uh, our our own policy uh, toward uh, Western cooperation or cooperation with Western countries. Uh, but uh, now we can see that uh, Russian Federation uh, don't agree with uh, this direction or with our foreign policy. But Ukraine is an, an independent uh, state and uh, we can decide uh, our own uh, decision. Uh, yes, uh, now it is uh, heavy to uh, to decide that such problems uh, because uh, we have uh, an aggressive uh, neighbor country as Russian Federation, and uh, now we are all participants of uh, such war. But uh, do you know that uh, yes, we have to improve our cooperation with neighbor countries, with uh, uh, as we call great countries, uh, as um, USA, Great Britain also. And uh, the aid from these countries helped to, uh, to win uh, in this war, I hope, and it is a great, uh, help for our country. But uh, do you know that uh, uh, this war shows that uh, uh, what future step we can, uh, we can make in future? Uh, and uh, uh, I hope that uh, um, 
will have possibility to uh, decide uh, to make decision um, uh, to make like an independent decision for our country and uh, do you know that uh, such uh, blocks as uh, for example not only nato but uh, in uh, yellow sea uh, in asia in um, uh, arabic gulf uh, in um, uh, uh arabic countries yes we can show that uh, we have like a hot points uh, uh, of our modern uh, international system and uh, um, in that region we have uh, problems with russian federation too and uh, i think that in future we'll have uh, we'll have the similar problems with china now that uh, world system uh, international system uh, to uh, is destroyed and it uh, it is in like an uh, like a movement something like that uh, and uh, do you know that i i i think that uh, in um, nearest future we will we'll can uh, watch uh, an, a new system uh for example uh, after the uh, end of uh, cold war uh, we can see one polar uh, one polar system of the international uh, international system yeah of the world uh, and uh, the main the main player uh, was usa but now we can um, see a, a start of growth of china china is now a is one of the uh, one of the powers uh, um, country in economical and uh, international relations and in uh, military uh, position too. And uh, uh, this war shows that Russia tried to show uh, their greatness, their uh, their position of a great country. But I think it is early to uh, to say about it and uh, uh, this uh, shape of international relation uh, i think it would be a bilateral system of international relations and ukraine is uh, like a bridge of this uh, construction thank you valeri i think that's quite insightful uh comment there um and just just to add on, on top of this, I know we, we from the history of what we know when the League of Nations was created after the World War One, uh, it was actually dissolved after World War Two as being an inefficient mechanism to handling the international conflicts and reach a peace. So perhaps that's a new opportunity to revise the system and reshape as adapted to the new environment. And actually, building on what you just mentioned, I have actually a question. And while I'm asking our question, I ask, uh, actually encourage the audience that is taking part in this meeting. And I know you, many of you are there. Please send your questions. We'll try to shoot and share with uh, our participants here. So um, we know that um, there is a lot of discussion right now about the information wars and there is a, so much focus on winning hearts and minds of those people in the West. But there is already a certain evidence that the Russian information or wars might not be actually targeting the West, uh, focusing uh, countries in Asia, in Africa. What do you think? What are the possible implications of this? Why there is such a, if you have a view on that? Uh, you know, uh, the recent uh, voting and resolution in the United Nations, which took place several weeks ago, have shown uh, who supports Russia or have voted neutral for the resolution condemning Russia for uh, the military aggression against Ukraine. And you have seen the, the list. The five uh, countries which voted against this resolution was Russia, Belarus, Syria, uh, Northern Korea, and Eritrea. So probably uh, Russians right now are trying to seek new partners. And of course, they have a big interest in Asia, especially if we are speaking about post-Soviet countries like Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and others. But also they have a big interest in Africa, uh, like they're building bunkers there, they're doing something there, they have their private military companies there. So the West finally probably understood that there is no way 
we can deal and trade with Putin's regime. So that is why they're seeking new partners somewhere else. Thank you, Dennis. Valery, do you have anything to add? Yeah, yeah uh, I would like to add that uh, this war is uh, like a step of possibility of the Russian Federation to change uh, uh, even uh, uh, Security Council uh, of uh, members of Security Council of the United Nations. Uh, as we could see that Belarus ch uh, changed uh, their constitution, articles of constitution uh, for the nu nuclear stat status, yeah? And uh, in future, uh, if uh, Russia uh, win uh, this war, uh, I, uh, I we can uh, we can see that uh, changes over the uh, um, participants uh, or members of the United Nations. But uh, I, I, I think and I wait that uh, they will not win. And um, but uh, some exchanges in uh, security policy of the world uh, we will see. But. Um, what uh, the what um, uh, the role of Belarus and uh, uh, Russians uh, partners uh, uh, will be it's uh, uh, it's difficult to say but I think that uh, some countries as uh, India or Pakistan will uh, will take part in the security process of the uh, international uh, relations uh, relations uh, constructions will be. Uh, I think so, and um, we will see in the nearest future uh, some exchanges in uh, such way. I, I, I think so. Thank you. And um, while while we have a few more minutes um, for this block. Um, and a lot, just very quickly, from your perspective, what are the sufficient conditions from your perspective that would ensure the termination of war in Ukraine? I will be very short. Ukraine's victory, nothing else. Thank you. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Ukraine's victory will open new uh, doors for uh, our uh, position in the international relations. And uh, uh, from one step, uh, our economy is destroyed, uh, maybe for 50 percent. But uh, I think that it is a possibility to uh, to build a more powerful economy and more powerful country in future for Ukraine. Um, maybe perhaps with help of uh, Marshall plans, uh, Marshall's plan, or maybe with uh, help of our our um, partners. Uh, but uh, do you know that now, uh, especially in Kharkiv, uh, I felt myself over like a participant of a great country, of great Ukrainian nation. Uh, and uh, if uh, before we could uh, feel uh, uh, such feeling when uh, Ukrainians uh, national team won uh, some games, but now uh, we feel uh, uh, every, every um, uh, citizen of Ukraine uh, feel themselves as a participant of a great uh, Ukrainian nation. Do you know that uh, uh, if we joke that Putin will help us to, be, to believe in ourselves? I think it is a new, uh, new opportunities for Ukraine in future. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Valery, for sharing your views. Um, if Denise, if you need to leave, thank you so much for taking part in this session. If you have uh, anyone in the participants or attendees have questions, please uh, send it across. And if there are specific questions to Denise, I'm happy to share it with him and we'll share it with you through some uh, through existing channels. So um, uh, using Valeria's wor words about uh, economic future, about of Ukraine, that's a nice intro to the next block that we have. It's um, uh, looking at the economic perspective and it's looking at uh, war from the economic lenses. And 
you know, for our listeners and attendees of participation is just to comprehend the full extent of, of war and the impact of war on the production and service industries in Ukraine. It's, it's quite difficult. But there are some stats that I think just sharing would be interesting for our audience to hear. And again, this is data that I have from the open sources, of course, and it's just looking at the infrastructure damages. We have more than 4,400 residential buildings, and we're talking about multi-story residential buildings being destroyed. Out of these 4,400 buildings, 650 have been completely destroyed. Right, we have uh, strong damages across several industries. We know aviation, we know steel production, agriculture, uh, particularly poultry production. There is where the damages are being assessed and uh, currently uh, immense. So there are a number of challenges uh, ahead of Ukraine. So I would like to invite our colleagues from Ivan Franko Lviv National University to share their views. And um, let's uh, start with Ostap, uh, with you, if you don't mind. So the question would be is, what do you think, what are the economic implications of war on Ukrainian economy? Are there any particular long-term effects that's worth mentioning? Okay. Thank you, Andrei. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's a big honor for me to participate in this meeting. Um, as the situation in Ukraine changed dynamically and dramatically, I am going to present here within my five minutes uh, some key points concerning political and economic phases of Russian war against Ukraine and, in fact, against the civilized world. According to the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, today Ukraine is paying the price for the West's failure to understand the threat posed by Vladimir Putin. Unfortunately, that's a very sad and costly truth for Ukrainian people. After Putin's annexation of Crimea, the United States and European Union went back to treating Russia as part of civilized community to make business as usual. In fact, the first step on that way was made by Putin some 15 years ago in a speech uh, given by Russian president in February 2007 at the Munich Security Conference. One and a half year after he made another move invading Georgia in August 2008. Still, there were no adequate reaction from the West, from the Western side, and that fact surely was considered by Russian analysts. The choice between principles and values from one hand and money and comfort from another was made in favor of the latter. And Russia used it to the fullest. One more extremely important point I would like to focus your attention on is the proclaimed desire of the Russian president for the citation, the final solution to the Ukrainian question which has the direct association with the well-known final solution to Jewish question by Adolf Hitler. Uh, considering economic implication of the war, we can make only some very, very preliminary notes. First of all, according to a report by United Kingdom-based Center for Economic and Business Research, the permanent conflict with Russia in years 2014 and 2020 has cost Ukraine 280 billion United States dollars. More precisely, during that year, Ukraine's lost output attributable to conflict with Russia totals up, totals up to $40 billion per year, which means around 20% of Ukraine's pre-conflict GDP. The 2014 year annexation of Crimea alone is worth up to 58 billion in lost GDP. The conflict in Donbass region has cost Ukraine up to 14.6 billion dollars a year. The conflict has had a major impact on trade and investment and has led to substantial losses of assets and tax revenues. After the February 24th media, different governmental and uh, analytical institutions provided the assessments of Ukraine's loss losses within very, very wide range from 150 to 1,500 dollars of United States. More precisely, as for March 17, according to Kiev School of Economics data, only the infrastructure losses are estimated up to $62.6 billion. At least 411 education institutions, 36 healthcare facilities, 
1,600 residential buildings, 26 factories and warehouses, 15 airports, six thermal power plants were destroyed or seized. Additionally, more than 15,000 kilometers of highways, 5,000 kilometers of railways were lost. Also, 350 bridges and bridge crossing were destroyed or decommissioned. On the other hand, according to, to another sources of data, namely the Deputy Minister of Economy, the losses were twice higher. 100, the infrastructure losses were twice higher. 120 billion, even for March 13. According to Finance Minister Sergei Marchenko, the negative consequences of the war will be enormous. The 10 regions where hostilities are taking place account for half of Ukrainian GDP. The Ministry of Economy estimated that the losses would amount one third to one half of GDP. According to another estimate, it is about $500 billion. Among other economic data, because of rather strong monetary policies during last years, our national currency revenue depreciated only around 16-17%. According to United Nations Development Program, up to 90% of Ukrainians will face poverty and extreme vulnerability if the war drags on to the next year. Up to 18 years of Ukraine's development can simply be nullified within 12-18 months. Still, as for me, despite the incredibly huge economic losses, even more important task for the wild and European community is to eliminate the probability of Russian aggression in the future. As we can see, due to the tragic Mariupol case, economic development and rebuilding makes no sense when the danger of a mad Russian invasion remains. Uh, finally, I would like to allow myself some emotions. So it is my pleasure to note here that the United Kingdom surely is among the top three countries which have made the biggest efforts to help my country and people. And your Prime Minister Johnson has become a real leader of the free world. Thank you so much. God bless the Queen. God bless the people of the United Kingdom. God bless Ukraine. Thank you for your attention and time. Thank you, Astab, um, for sharing these numbers, sharing the estimates and the impact on the Ukrainian economy. It is quite a staggering impact. It's very hard to even estimate the potential uh, implications of all this, in even in the medium and long run, not even to say in the short run. That's what we already see. Well, um, I would like to turn now to Tatiana and now basically, what do you think? <laughs> Rebuilding Ukraine, what, what would it take? Hey, good afternoon, dear colleagues. And uh, first of all, we would like to thank our close and uh, reliable friend, the United Kingdom, for great support during one of the worst time in the history of our country. We will forever be grateful to those who extended a helping hand to us when it was vital for us. Our nation not only knows how to and will withstand each century's old terminators, but also knows how and will stand side by side with its friends if they need this help. Thank you also for the opportunity to address such a distinguished audience. The proposed topic for discussion concerns the main methods and directions of economic recovery in Ukraine. Extremely complex issue that requires the use of systematic and comprehensive both economic and political tools. I believe that we should now seriously talk about the recovery of Ukraine's economy without legally formalized global security guarantees. Of course, this is not about a guarantee from criminal and deceitful Russia, verbal and written commitments of which are no more to be believed. 
we understand that one should not expect an influx of domestic and uh, uh, foreign investment in a country that will be permanently threatened by new aggression. Given a formation of a reliable security model, Ukrainian's economic recovery will um, require a combination of external financial technological support tools and an internal mechanism not only to restore but also to reform Ukraine's economy. Many cities and towns in the north, east and south of Ukraine have simply been wiped off the face of the east. They don't exist anymore as 80-90% of their buildings have been bombed and destroyed. And it's impossible now just to return to the cities, clean up, sweep there and live on. Everything needs to be rebuilt and to be rebuilt very quickly so that people who have been forced to flee the war have a place to return to. This is a necessary condition for the remigration of labor and human capital back to Ukraine. But of course, it's not enough. Rebuilding the destroyed economy and its infrastructure is an impossible task only for a country wounded in the war. Undoubtedly, this should be done at the expense of contributions and reparations from the aggressor country. But we also hope for a strategy of financial and technolog technological support from the world community. The results of empirical and uh, scientific economic research convincingly show the highest level of multiplier of public spending on infrastructure. This should be a powerful catalyst for economic growth in Ukraine. Rebuild, <coughs> uh, the, uh, in addition, the um, involvement of the population in the reconstruction of the country uh, is able to absorb a significant share of labor that will help to solve the problem of unemployment and will increase effective demand to induce economic growth. Tactical and strategic, strategic mechanism for uh, rebuilding Ukraine's economy will depend on how quickly the war ends and the enemy is driven out of the occupied territories where vital and export-oriented sectors of the economy including metallurgy allocated. Uh, as for the internal forces of economic re recovery, the government of Ukraine has already used various um, effective mechanisms to stimulate the development of small and medium-sized businesses. We are talking about the maximum level of deregulation of the economy and uh, tax liberalization, the mechanism of interest-free businesses lending, support and development of high-tech industries, including the IT sector and more. Effective recovery of Ukraine's economy should also include transformation of its structure. In particular, the uh, transition from raw materials 
and agricultural type of uh, economy to technological, in which Ukraine will be able to sell the world not only grain and ore, but a variety of high value added products. A special consideration requires the issue of energy security, which is urgent not only for Ukraine, but for the economies of many European countries. We hope that development and implementation of effective mechanism of global economic support to Ukraine, similar to the Marshall Plan, combined with the intensification of domestic factors of economic growth will give us an opportunity to talk not only about German, Japanese, of Asian, but also about Ukrainian economic miracle. Glory to Ukraine. Sam. Thank you, Tatiana. Um, I. Oh, that was quite an extensive uh, uh, this uh, inquiry into the, um, the the economic structure of Ukraine and uh, actually some of the questions that our audience is asking, and uh, I'm I'll just ask a question. You partially answered the, your question uh, well, during your talk, but I'll just want to repeat it. It's from uh, Professor Stephen Jenkins from our Social Policy Department. Were there something like a Marshall Plan after the war? Uh, what sectors of Ukrainian economy do you think should be prioritized? Uh, infrastructure, particular sectors, um, uh, apart from the uh, grain sector that you mentioned and some infrastructure investment that you mentioned, Tatiana, already. Um, any, any, uh, any specifics? Is the question to Tanya or to, to all? Uh, for you, who, a stop or do you, Tatiana, do, who wants to answer this question? Tanya, may I? Yes, of course. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, surely uh, a lot of money uh, should be invested in, in the rebuilding of our infrastructure. So you heard some data I presented and uh, unfortunately we should suppose that these data are very far from final data after the end of the war. So um, saying about the the advantages, the comparative advantages of the Ukrainian economy, we should say about the quick and uh, drastic development of our IT industry, which during the last 10 years um, grows with a rate sometimes 15, sometimes 20% per the year. So um, the, the, good, um, the good point in favor of the development of IT industry is that um, a lot of young people from Ukraine who studied in the United States, in Europe, uh, even now, even now, uh, during the war, they help uh, their country with the money, but even now they plant uh, a lot of different startups which uh, would be projected in our country after our victory. So, uh, also, our comparative advantages in grain production uh, should be to a great extent uh, saved because uh, if the war would end during some months, uh, sure, there would be a lot, a lot of losses in agriculture production. But as for now, our, our Minister of Agriculture uh, has orientation to receive the harvest within 70% from the previous year. Oh, thank you. Uh, I want to agree with uh, Stab and I want to add that we uh, should change the main direction of our international uh, trade uh, relationship. Uh, we must develop our relationship with uh, uh, not Russia, uh, but instead of uh, another European countries, uh, for example, the United Kingdom, USA, and other uh, great Germany and other great players of the world. Thank you, Tatiana. Um, I have, we have also a question from uh, Dr. Vicente Silva from the uh, social policy department as well. Um, so 
It's a very interesting question. If the end of the war leaves Ukraine in a neutral ge geopolitical position, would the country be allowed to receive international aid uh, funds uh, to build things back? Or would it mean economic isolation? What so wants I, to contribute? I should, I should suppose that, in fact, uh, there are not so many chances to be in real neutral position in international relations because um, during more than uh, two dozens of years, Ukraine, in fact, was a neutral country, and we all can see just now the results of such neutrality. So for, as for now, for more than 90% of Ukrainian people are sure that Ukraine will win, and such a victory, as for me, should be closely connected with the alliance with Europe and not kind of neutrality. So despite some, despite some problems with our entering the NATO, such problems are clear and evident and we can understand the behavior of our European partners still. We suppose that the best idea for Ukraine is to become a European Union and NATO member. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, that, um, that's, I think that's from, for now, we don't have any more questions on the, um, uh, international relations. And I think we will address some of them uh, at the end of this discussion. Uh, thank you, Valeri, for already responding to some of the questions that uh, participants have posted in the, in the chat, in the discussion session, uh, Q&A session. Um, so, uh, we know that, uh, you know, the numbers that you have suggested are stopped and the things that requires reconstruction and rebuilding in Ukraine are quite vast in Ukraine. And uh, we know the World Bank already built in preparing 3 billion package to support Ukraine in the coming months and provide up, obviously additional support to the neighboring countries to receive uh, Ukrainian refugees. Uh, However, the, the question is, you know, the, how much more realistically would we be required? And then uh, will be Ukraine will be able, how will Ukraine will be able to repay all this? Because most of those are the loans and uh, that would require considerable investment to, for repayment. Any, any views, any Tatiana or stop, or shall we leave it as it is? So um, as for me, it's too early to, uh, to uh, say about these problems because uh, as a first step, we should win. And after that, the situation would be rather different. And that, that would be the time for, for answering uh, such kinds of questions. OK. Thank you. Well, uh, it's not a question whether we will win, but when. So uh, hoping for the quick uh, end of the of the war uh, and on this note let's let's talk about some more uh, some of the pressing issues as from the social perspective and we know uh, this is topic is not the last uh, on the agenda it's not it's one of the most sensitive topics given the, the scale of humanitarian crisis that's taking place right now in 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 Europe and globally and I'm just looking at the data data from United Nations we have three million six hundred refugees uh, with three countries in Europe taking bulk of them with Poland more than two million hundred thousand refugees Romania more than five hundred fifty thousand refugees Moldova three hundred seventy thousand refugees this this number is only for the refugees that are leaving Ukraine and when we talk about number of internal displaced people it's the number even more staggering it's it's very hard to imagine the number it's seven million people being have, has left the home and is it a lot i think it's one out of every fourth person in ukraine was forced to leave their house that's that's a number that can kind of gives a perspective there um so now i just wanted to turn now the question to timothy uh break from uh kiev school of economics and uh can we talk quickly talk about social inequality and what the future holds for ukrainians yeah sure so Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to your audience. Um, 
our partners from the think tank CEDOS have started data collection um, to analyze um, grievances and conditions of uh, displaced people in Ukraine. But I will comment on that a bit later in the end of my opening statement. I will try to structure my answer, well, or my statement in, um, in several points. So first of all, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, resilience, resilience of the Ukrainian nation. Uh, about uh, civil society and some policy dimensions of uh, this resilience. And from that, I will um, segue to, to your question. Um, so, and the reason I, I'd like to talk about it is because I see, I have seen already uh, that this surprising resilience of Ukrainians have generated a lot of uh, interest uh, around the world. So quite a lot of journalists or scholars, they often comment on that or they ask questions about that. So I want to clarify some things. And I want to uh, say that according to sociological data, and I can refer to you know, a very vast scholarship which has existed at least from the early 90s. Uh, and there are quite a lot of surveys and field experiments and qualitative data and panel data that all points out to the fact that Ukrainians as a nation have been quite unified in terms of their feelings of national identity and adherence to statehood and sovereignty. So what we see from, again, from various data that on the surface, there is a significant variation in terms of local policies, maybe some local political preferences, you know, that some Ukrainians vote for one, presidential candidate and other Ukrainians would support another presidential candidate or also preferences in terms of language use that some Ukrainians have preferences to speak in Ukrainian and other in Russian language. Nevertheless, uh, in terms of national identity and the adherence to statehood, Ukraine is uh, Ukrainians are quite homogeneous. And moreover, we have seen an increasing trend starting from 2014, 2015 in different uh, socio-demographic groups in all regions of Ukraine. We have seen even the increasing trends in this adherence to the idea that Ukrainian state is important to respondents, uh, proudness of being Ukrainian uh, and support or endorsement of language policies, meaning that even if people speak Russian language, they would support the idea that Ukrainian language should be uh, present in public communication or in educational institutions. So I think Russians have miscalculated <laughs> Ukraine quite a lot and, and decided to attack in the, in the worst time in, in history during the up, uh, growing trend of unification. The second is civil society. I think it's important to stress that what we see now is not exponential. It's not like overnight Ukrainians woke up and became, became quite resilient. Um, you can trace back quite a lot of what is happening now to 2014 and 2015. Uh, quite a lot of civil society organizations and groups were created after the occupation of Crimea, Lugansk, and Donetsk. There are many NGOs that uh, specifically help to displaced people or to army or to veterans. There are quite a lot of activists and practices and informal institutions that have developed since 2014 and 15 in terms of you know, how to organize or how to communicate. Um, so quite a lot of Ukrainians simply activated their channels of communication and their practices uh, that existed from 2014 and 15. And going to policy dimension, uh, I also would like to emphasize that Ukraine before 2015 and after 2015, uh, well, has changed quite a lot. Uh, there, are there were several policies implemented. And I, you know, in my opinion, I, I think one of the crucial policies was the decentralization reform. Ukraine used to be quite a centralized uh, nation in terms of you know, national government deciding quite a lot on spend, local spending or local taxation policies. This is not the case anymore. Uh, new local communities emerged and they received quite a lot of uh, opportunities to 
register new businesses, uh, to secure more tax base, and to spend it on uh, local uh, welfare. Uh, and from different, again, from different sources, including my own surveys, including panel data, we have observed an increase in trend of trust to local authorities, satisfaction with uh, services, and uh, even satisfaction with local doctors, uh, family doctors during the COVID, and uh, increasing trend in uh, democratic participation. So more people attended elections, uh, more people participated in um, things like participatory budgets, uh, signed petitions, things like that. So it is not a surprise that quite a lot of Ukrainians, you know, were and are willing to protect their homeland, not only from the perspective of this national identity, but also from the perspective of their local unity, uh, social capital, which, which has been, uh, which has increased massively and general um, endorsement of the local uh, governments and uh, local mayors. And to answer to your question more uh, directly, I think this policy dimension is very important because what we see right now is that Ukraine, of course, suffers and struggles, but we have a functioning war economy, meaning that trains are working, you know, national bank is working, uh, quite a lot of businesses try to uh, function as well. There are supply chains. Uh, you know, I, I went out for groceries this morning. So the, it is very important to keep in mind that this um, decentralization provided local communities and local administrations with additional human capital and resources to be able to, um, to be resilient now and to host and accommodate uh, displaced people. So I think quite a lot of action will be um, observed there, you know, in terms of uh, this capacity to prepare shelters, to redistribute welfare, to open local businesses. So quite a lot of um, activities will be there. And I think um, uh, our government has already uh, responded to these challenges by suggesting um, buy out, for instance, to, uh, to buy old uh, warehouses or uh, to, um, to donate money to those people who are hosting um, displaced people. They can expect some compensations per, uh, per person in terms of uh, utility spending, for instance. Um, another interesting dimension would be international collaboration. So people usually underestimate it, but you know, perhaps you know about this international policy of uh, sisterhood cities. So some local communities and uh, cities, they have direct support from their uh, Western partners. Um, yeah, and uh, humanitarian support, which is coming right now, is also being uh, received and redistributed. So I can talk about this in more details during the um, Q&A session, but I also would like to plug in this think tank, CEDOS, C-E-D-O-S, they are collecting data and they're collecting data in terms of policy suggestions, what government is doing to support displaced people, but also in terms of, you know, uh, some qualitative and quantitative data in terms of the resources, accommodations and grievances. Over. Thank you, Timothy. Uh, thanks for, for, for your response. Um, if I encourage people in attendance still, we have a lot of attendees online. Please ask your questions. I'm happy to channel those uh, questions to our participants. So um, my question, it's actually not actually a question, it's just a building on top of what you just said and uh, you know how the Ukrainian community, how the community of free neighboring countries are responding. And uh, it's anecdotal evidence, but I have a firsthand experience when the evacuation of my own family ha was happening, ha you know, just to highlight the triumph of humanity that's happening both in Ukraine and outside of Ukraine. Welcome, the welcome and the volunteers supporting Ukrainians, um, refugees on the border, helping them with the uh, uh, with uh, lodging, uh, transportation, food, easements, and this, I just applaud uh, all the neighboring countries uh, 
that are supporting Ukraine and people in Ukraine who are supporting the refugees uh, and internally displaced people. Um, it's, it, is, it is a triumph of humanity, but as I say, we should not underestimate the potential impact, long-term impact on the Ukrainian society and you know, uh, social capital within the country. Uh, Tatiana mentioned some interesting numbers on the potential impact on the welfare of Ukrainians after the, uh, in the post-war uh, situation. And we know that there will be the impact. And we know that the large um, number of refugees are actually planning to come back to Ukraine. However, this is on their assumption that the war will not last long. Uh, it would be worse to discuss what, is, what if these people will not be coming back, how this will affect the social capital and in Ukraine. Um, any, any views on this? It's a long worded uh, question, but anyways. Absolutely. Um, the risk is very high. So um, there is a very high risk of losing social capital and human capital. Um, Preliminary survey uh, data, which uh, we have collected, confirms what you say, that quite a lot of Ukrainians are willing to return back. Um, so we're using different methods to collect this data. For instance, we have partners with the, who use this online smartphone application called Gradus, meaning that this is a regular online panel data and according to their estimations about quarter of their usual users um, now stay abroad so we were able to reach out to these ukrainians who are abroad and receive answers from them and uh, and yes I, I can confirm that these people are willing to to return back uh, the question here is more in terms of policies yeah so how what should we do to ensure um that we can limit brain drain and to um, secure human capital. Uh, first of all, and not to mention, you know, some small policy details that are happening right now, which is significant for all Ukrainians, let's say martial uh, law, yeah, men are not allowed to leave the country. So we, we also now see some uh, gender disbalances in terms of uh, refugees. So I can say from the perspective of the academic community, our university, and I think most of our um, audience uh, also belong to academia. So right now, our university is working in partnership with some other private universities. Unfortunately, our networks are, um, you know, uh, biased. So we would like to include more public universities as well, but uh, you know, step by step, we are working on this new project, which we call uh, Global Ukrainian University. And this project is a network of universities. And the goal of this network is to simultaneously help students who are displaced and are located within Ukraine, and to those students and academics who are abroad. And the idea is to create almost a union, you know, so we can protect these people, we can ensure that they will receive uh, their education, uh, that the uh, help is not short term. So suppose there is a Ukrainian student somewhere in Germany or Poland or Canada, and if they need to get into the university now, we want to help them with accreditation and also to make sure that they will receive scholarship not for three or six months, but for three or four years. And the idea is that they will also receive our um, diplomas of this Ukrainian Global University. So they will return home, they, their diplomas will be recognized and they can you know, support uh, development of Ukrainian economy. This is a big picture plan here. Yeah, it demands a lot of complicated steps, uh, how to harmonize uh, so many different activities that are happening in Europe, Canada and the US, but we are working on that. We, we have designed the web page. We, we collected some data. We already signed more than 20 memorandums of understanding with different universities who agreed to participate in these uh, activities uh, in the United States and Canada and in Europe. And we will try to scale it up even to other continents. Uh, so I guess my message here is that Ukrainians who belong to different domains, you know, business, academia, um, industries, they all universally are motivated to return to Ukraine and to rebuild the country. And our civil society and government is, you know, also endorses this idea and we are ready to, to design policies 
and institutions to to work on that. Thanks, Timothy. I think this um, that's interesting initiative, uh, global university initiative that you mentioned. Probably you may pass this information along at the closing notes of this talk, and perhaps we can facilitate some of the conversation going beyond the this discussion. Um, I think you also touched about uh, some of the topics and one of the questions that from the audience from Grace, um, uh, from uh, International Development and Humanitarian Emergencies. Uh, uh, the question is, what effect is the restriction of for men crossing the border having on the decision for individuals or families to leave or stay in the country? Is the fact that refugees are primarily women and children affecting their relative acceptance that they're experiencing in neighboring countries? That's quite an interesting question. Thank you, Grace. Timofey? Yeah, I can comment on that from some preliminary data. And the data, uh, you know, uh, it, it's usually coming from three independent sources. There are either some anecdotal or very early qualitative um, um, sources media analysis so we monitor social media and we try to um, follow what people are writing on facebook and twitter or some special uh, channels like telegram group or viber groups that are created specifically for idps uh, and migrants and third we are talking about this early preliminary surveys so um yes the issue is there that uh, mostly women are uh, with kids or maybe people who are older than 60 are traveling abroad. We have not yet observed specific difficulties in terms of being accepted. In contrast, you know, Poland and other countries, they actually lifted some regulations to make it possible to accept people faster and to accommodate them. Nevertheless, we have noticed issues more in terms of, you know, mental health and social capital. So these people are, they feel stressed, they feel abandoned, they feel uh, bad about their, you know, relatives who stay in Ukraine. And there are some early concerns about possible human traffic issues and some exploitation of these uh, um, people. Unfortunately, we don't have specific data of that, but what we see, we see a growing discussion on social media. So people are concerned about it. People are stressed. They're talking to each other, trying to, you know, uh, find, um, you know, build networks of trust. Like how, how should we live here? How should we support each other? How, how should we talk to, to strangers? So we observe all these uh, kind of, um, how to say, that the conversation, they, they, they raise these concerns. Um, on the other hand, there is another part to this um, to this topic is that some people are not willing to leave Ukraine exactly because they don't want to be separated. Yeah, so there are families they don't want to uh, be separated, so they would rather stay with their um, male partners, um, or they will stay in anticipation. You know that the war is going to be over soon. Uh, of course, these decisions are also affected by social economic status and whether people can find a job uh, in these new communities, uh, whether they can work remotely or whether they can receive some immediate welfare packages. Yeah, so far there, uh, today there was an announcement that the Ukrainian government already distributed some first welfare packages. Uh, I think it was something like 6,000 uh, hryvnas per person who who registered, but yeah, it's a small money. So yeah, so this is a big issue. Um, we'll see. We'll see how it's uh, going to develop. Um, but of course, we will need to design uh, specific policies to, to support these people. Thank you, Timofey. There is um, a related question uh, from Orsolov, uh, my uh, colleague, uh, PhD student in the LC Department of Social Policy. Um, she's thanking you all for uh, sharing and the people are learning a lot. And uh, she was wondering if you have any information about unaccompanied children displaced abroad. abroad. I think that's also uh, evident even locally uh, through some uh, evidence that there's some people are kids are arriving unaccompanied in in the Western countries. Um, yeah. Is there is any information about that? Unfortunately, I don't have any specific information on that, except that to the best of my knowledge, there are some 
local and international uh, organization that try to support um, displaced children. I'm talking mostly about UNICEF and Red Cross. They have set some uh, special camps in uh, large uh, towns in Western Ukraine, including Ternopil, um, Lviv, uh, I think Chernivtsi. And I guess, I guess they should be involved in similar activities in uh, Poland or uh, Moldova, but unfortunately, I don't know. Thank you, Dimitri. Um, if if you know anyone else has questions, uh, please uh, shoot them now. We can uh, address uh, questions to Dimitri directly, or we can uh, start asking questions uh, about uh, uh, other topics that we have been discussed today. Uh, some of the questions have been answered. Thank you, Valeri. Uh, you built super active there. Thanks for active participation there. Um, now uh, there is a question. No, I don't see any more questions from the audience. Uh, okay, just a second. So we have a question from Paul Frichtes. Uh, sorry if I misspelled your last name. <laughs> um, does the panel have a sense of the support within Russia to sustain a long war in Ukraine? Is there a widespread support within Russia to have wars to prove their great power? And what does, a does it, you know, what does the impact of the long-term relations between Russia and Ukraine look like? Enemies forever, friends once more. I can try to comment and then, yeah, I also see Ostap uh, unmuted himself. So maybe Ostap, you can start and I will. Okay, make only two two or three sentences so as for as for today there were new sociological data that as for now 74 percent of russian uh, people support the war with ukraine mm -hmm. so uh, i can i can uh, according to the long run uh relations between ukraine and, and russia i i i can only um, propose a citation of former israeli Prime Minister Hoda Mayor, that there is no space for uh, for consent if another part is going to kill you. Thank you. Yes, I concur Thank with you. the stop. Um, I want to comment also as a sociologist. Uh, obviously, there is an elephant in the room. You know, a lot of people question the reliability of polls uh, conducted in either authoritarian regimes or regimes with, um, you know, when, when opposition is threatened, etc. Nevertheless, biases is not the reason to just throw data away. We just, we have to be aware of these biases and we have to think how to control for them. Uh, there are many sources of biases. For instance, a rally around the flag is another powerful bias, yeah? So, and these biases can cancel each out uh, uh, cancel out each other. Yeah, some people, they're not willing to speak up because they're afraid, but some people are just, you know, they're rallying uh, around the flag and they're willing to, to show their support of, uh, of what the political power is doing. So it's very important to contextualize these polls. So what we try to do, we try to use several data sources. We try to complement this with uh, media analysis, reading, you know, Twitter, Telegram, Viber. And we also try to analyze not only immediate polls, sort of support of war or not support of war, but also try to analyze some long trends in terms of what people think in general about NATO or, or Europe or uh, Ukrainians. And there are plenty of data like that that dates back for, you know, five, seven years. So drawing from all these different data sources, I'm quite confident uh, to say that a vast majority of Russians, unfortunately, they're quite supportive or, of their political elites. Uh, the reasons can be different. Yeah, maybe they are just uh, washed by the propaganda. Maybe it's uh, um, socialization. Maybe this is social economic status. I don't want to talk about it now. The important thing is that the vast majority of Russians are either supportive or kind of indifferent to this war, which raises a lot of alarm and concerns. It's very difficult to negotiate with, uh, you know, with, with this nation. And also it's very difficult to um, expect any regime change. Yeah, so 
um, even if this current political elite goes away, they will, um, yeah, the nation is not going anywhere. So I'm quite pessimistic in that sense. And I think Russians, they will have to go through a very long transformation. Yeah? And to answer to the question about the future, is there any, you know, what, what will happen in the future between Ukrainians and Russians? So Astap already said it quite eloquently i concur with what he said nevertheless i guess maybe i'm just an i don't know maybe i'm just optimist or something um i think maybe in, in generations two or three generations uh our grandchildren maybe they will find a way to talk to each other and build better world uh, you know we have these examples uh after the second world war right now we see that Germans, Dutch, French, and English people, they come, they, they come along, yeah? So maybe in three generations, two generations, we will see some positive change as well, given fundamental and structural changes in Russian political elites, media landscape, and uh, inclusive economic institutions. Thank you, Dimitri. If I may, if I, may I, to, I would like to, to add a couple of words. If you need, uh, if you want, I can retell a, a, a discussion uh, of my father with uh, one, uh, so, uh, not soldier, one Russian officer. My, uh, my father now is uh, stay at uh, occupied territory because uh, he had no possibility to went away. And uh, you, you, uh, all of you would be surprised uh, when he met the officer. Officer uh, told him, "Don't worry, uh, it will be everything very good for you in a couple of days." And uh, my father asked, "What? What's the matter? Why are you here?" He answered that, uh, "Don't worry, we know that um, Ukrainian army have war with." Ukrainian Nazists and Ukrainian people, uh, uh, Ukrainian people uh, suffers from Nazists. And we know that now we are here and uh, Ukrainian army uh, bring a weapon and go with us. Uh, or, or bring a weapon, or maybe they go with us to war against Ukrainian Nazis. He was surprised. I am surprised. You are surprised, I think so too. And uh, yes, it's, uh, I know, I think it's a normal dialogue between my father and Russian officer, but Russian officer believe uh, in this thesis. Do you know that it is strange situation? But uh, I had the same uh, same conversation with uh, my uh, friends uh, from different institutes of uh, uh, of Russia, yeah, the scientific institutes of Russia, and some of they is the same uh, similar words. Uh, some of them uh, they says uh, say that uh, they are upset. Uh, about this war and uh, they were surprised uh, and uh, they but uh, uh, they uh, they are not ready to say against anything against um, uh, this regime it's very difficult people are afraid uh, to be arrested uh, they uh, they are afraid to lose their job uh, I understand them, but uh, do you know that it is a, a very strange situation when people believe in, I don't know, like uh, some uh, crazy stories about, uh, 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 I don't know, uh, Reich of Ukrainian, something like that, um, fascist, Nazi Reich of Ukraine. And my father asked him, uh, him well, uh, now you are in uh, my country village. Uh, uh, if you find uh, any uh, Nazis in my country village, uh, uh, I'll uh, bring you a bottle of vodka like a present. It's a strange situation, but uh, it is true. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I want to quickly jump into what Valeri just said. I think it's very important to stress for the audience that what Valeri just said, yeah, he described this conversation with a 
army officer. But these beliefs, they're widespread in different socioeconomic groups. I had the same conversations with my colleagues who are from academia. So we are talking about people who work in IT, people who work in academia, historians, sociologists, working class people. So social, social economic background does not explain what's happening here. Yeah. So people from different ages and different income groups and different social classes, they all, well, not all, but we see this adherence to Russian propaganda and believe in it in all social groups. And this is what is worrying. So if you really want to address it, you have to address it simultaneously in so many different bubbles. It's not about one specific group. It's not about, you know, some uh, deprivated. Yeah, it's, it's widespread. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And I think what is important also to highlight, no, some of those groups, they have access to alternative sources of information. They have good internet access. They are exposed to the information from different sources, but still they believe, stronger belief and convince about um, common beliefs in in what's happening in Ukraine and you know the, the need for uh, helping and, and saving Ukrainians from so-called Nazis uh, with uh, our presidents of Jewish origin. So I think it's uh, incredible uh, what's happening. And this is, gives actually, unfortunately, lots of room for research and under, trying to understand how this happened and what were the mechanisms that led to this, such a um, hype notice on the country scale. I think we have one more question. Uh, I just uh, related to the termination of war, and I think we would need to wrap up for today. So uh, this is a question from Harini, and uh, the, her question is: um, uh, With the current sanctions imposed by the West and Russia and China aim to develop na native internet channels and native financial financial mechanism, independent from SWIFT. Um, what would this mean for the future, given possible future aggressions by Russia? and ability of the Western countries to put pressure on such aggression. What would it mean for Ukraine? Anyone would like to comment on that? So my, my eye, so <clears throat> I suppose that after in many Western countries, the Russian president was labeled as a war criminal. So it looks like Western countries are not going to wait during key years till the end of this regime. So it looks like they are going to fasten that processes and that um, as for now, we, we don't think about uh, such developments during many years. So it looks like West is, uh, is, is ready to put the final of that regime, but they don't know how, how to do that uh, we, without, without endangering the nuclear war. Thank you. Thank you, Astop. And before we wrap up, I just wanted to, to share my uh, a few words before I pass to you, Lucinda. So I want to thank you all for the great discussion today and a uh, special thank you for you, Lucinda, for proposing this event and uh, making it happen. Really big thank you uh, from me. Um, thank you to all the audience that joined today and those who participated in the discussion. Great to see this uh, involvement here. And I just wanted to remind you, it's a 28th day of uh, Russian attack on Ukraine and the war will terminate, uh, but there's no clarity when. So we have to stay put and we have to do our best to stop the war apply by planning to rebuild Ukraine, a new, modern, powerful and free country as it was supposed to be and it, as it was. And I also sincerely hope that Putin, those who support him, uh, reach the destination of the Russian warship as soon as possible. Slava Ukraini. Heroim Slava. Heroim Slava. Thank you. Slava Ukraine, Ukraine to Slava. Thank you. Yes, that's a, a, um, I mean, it was, we learned, we, I think we all learned a lot. It was very insightful. It was, it was, um, it was fantastic to have you all with us and to um, hear your perspectives and to answer our questions. Um, so um, just for the, the, the um, this has been um, recorded. So the subject to no technical difficulties, the podcast will be available if people want to um, hear again or to share with it when it's made available. And um, thank you. And um, our thoughts are with you.
Thank you so much.